Travis did a mock draft. Um, he did. I am sure it's the worst mock draft ever because all of them are. But how is this shaping <laughs> up now? Chicago with the number one and number two overall pick. I'm going to assume they're not sticking with Justin Fields at this point. No, uh, they absolutely aren't. And um, Brad Spielberger just posted an article on Twitter that he wrote 3,000 words on how to fix the Bears <laughs> franchise. I haven't read it yet, so I can't wait to dive into that here after this show. But here in this mock draft, it, you know, if they're picking number one, it's so obvious. They're not going to trade the number one pick again. They're going to be moving on from Justin Fields. And let's be honest, if they're picking number one overall, everyone is probably gone. The entire coaching staff is probably gone. And the only one who might survive it is Ryan Poles. Mm -hmm. I don't think at this point, even if they're picking number one overall, that Poles would be gone. But man, there have been some transactions, it feels like, that have not looked pretty on uh, guys that Poles have brought in. It's it's highlighted, obviously, by what's going on with Chase Claypool right now. And so, you know, believing in Justin Fields uh, over the quarterback class with C.J. Stroud and Anthony Richardson in particular – look very very good that's a tough pill to swallow the chase claypool trades obviously a tough pill to swallow you, know, you get dj moore saying to the buccaneers when they play the team like oh they're not using you right yeah you're telling me it's like all right that's not great yeah the defensive line can't get after the quarterback and i know that's kind of a work in progress there but you spend a ton of money on on two linebackers and it's like man it's uh if they pick number one overall there will be a case to move on from ryan poles even though i don't think that it would happen and probably would tell you it's a little bit too early. Not every GM is perfect. He's figuring it out. So all that to say, pick one and two. I ended up going with two offensive players. Caleb Williams goes number one overall. That was the easy one. Mm -hmm. Number two, I don't want to say is tougher of a selection. This is the one that they got from the Panthers, which, yikes. Um, but it's either, to me, this one comes down to you're either taking Marvin Harrison Jr., and you're pairing Caleb Williams with an elite wide receiver the second he steps on into the NFL. So you got Marvin Harrison Jr., you got DJ Moore. Or you go with an offensive tackle. And it's a really good offensive tackle class. So a guy like Joe Alt uh, from Notre Dame, a guy like Penn State's Olu Fashanu, who could have been a top 10 pick at offensive tackle last year. Maybe you'd rather go with an offensive line pick to say, hey, we're supporting Caleb Williams by making sure that he's not going to die back there. So that was that's kind of my back and forth of I landed on Caleb Williams and Marvin Harrison Jr., but you really could go with um, wide receiver or offensive tackle, I think, for that next pick to help set him up. Yeah, it's the uh, it's the 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 next version of the Panay Sewell versus Jamar Chase debate, except you took yep. the quarterback one pick ahead of them. <laughs> it's like which guy which guy is going to be uh, the the option? The the one argument I think that would make you I, I don't have a horse in this race. I could be convinced in either direction. Um, but one argument that might make you go for the offensive tackle is just how deep the wide receiver class is every year at this point. Mm -hmm. you, and you can get, you know, their next pick will be the top of the second round. And instead of Chase Claypool, you can actually get somebody that can contribute and maybe be an impact player at the top of the second in wide receiver terms, whereas you're probably not getting that guy on the offensive line at the top of the right. second, or there's a much steeper drop off at that point. So yeah, Marvin Harrison yeah. may well be generational, and we talked about him before, but you know, we you look at any of the last few draft classes, you're gonna be able to find a wide receiver in the second round that comes in and makes a big impact as well. And if you can get that guy in addition to Caleb Williams, in addition to the the top offensive tackle on the board, now that's a haul that I would get behind. Yeah, yeah. I uh, we we had this conversation on um, NFL Stock Exchange. We did it. We did a mock draft as well, even independent from the one that I did. We myself and Connor Rogers. We went back and forth just doing a new mock. He ended up going with Olu Fashano at two, and that was the conversation that we had. Is Olu looks very, very good in terms of a pass protecting offensive tackle. I mean, the dude moves super well. He's so fluid he's so dominant at pass blocking already even as a college player needs to get stronger needs to be a little bit more of a force in the run game but i think that's something that could definitely um, be taught it's very it's a lot tougher to teach those pass blocking tools so a player like that even for as special as marvin harrison jr is the 
capitalistic supply and demand of how many of these types of guys are going to be available would probably lend itself towards you taking the offensive line pick and then having Olu as your left tackle and uh, and Darnell Wright as your right tackle for the foreseeable future. So those are the only two undefeated, or not undefeated, un- lack of win teams. What the un, hell is- un, unwind, un- unwinded. Yeah, unvictoried <laughs> teams in the NFL. The, the only teams that have yet to re- record any kind of victory, and Chicago owns the draft pick for both of them. Uh, the next three teams, um, all one and three, Las Vegas Raiders at number three, the Denver Broncos number four, the Minnesota Vikings at number five. What have we done there? Yeah, so QB for the Raiders, this one's easy. Um, And in reality, I think that the Chicago Bears at number two overall, certainly after they take Caleb Williams, will be having an auction for that number two overall pick if Drake May ends up becoming the prospect that we believe that he can. Because if there are four or five teams that need a quarterback and they're all picking in the top 12, maybe even all picking in the top 10, Chicago can move back down from that two spot, continue to acquire first round picks in in future years to own the draft the way that they do. And you can still get a, probably a really good offensive tackle and a really good wide receiver kind of the conversation that we were having there. So didn't have trades in this mock, so it was easy. Vegas going with May at three. Denver Broncos, I didn't have them taking a quarterback just because the Russell Wilson contract is atrocious. And I, I don't know how much you can really get out of that, even if you wanted to. And maybe uh, if there's any head coach that's going to be bold enough to do this, I guess maybe it's it's Sean Payton, but bench a guy who's taking up $55 million of your cap space because he's just not good enough at quarterback and you're going to draft what quarterback in this draft. <laughs> I guess Sean Payton might be crazy enough to do it, but I'm just not convinced of that. So instead I had him taking an edge rusher. I love Layatu Latu from UCLA, six foot five, two hundred and sixty five pounds. Uh, just the handwork is brilliant. Uh, he's got such a fluid and productive combination of size, speed, and especially flexibility. Man, you can put this guy with his hand in the dirt in a three point stance, or he can rush from a two point stance. No matter what, he feels like a, a mismatch for any offensive tackle that he's gone up against. Uh, so he's he is my number four overall pick. He's my number one edge rusher in this draft, and then five Vikings. This is where. This is where the mock draft exercise starts to be different from a big board, where I have them taking J.J. McCarthy from Michigan. And not only do I not have J.J. McCarthy in my top 40 right now, he wouldn't even be my next quarterback off the board. Bo Nix would be the next highest quarterback for me in my rankings. But mock draft exercises are naturally more towards predicting what you think is going to happen. And at this time of year, it's a, it's a little bit of a mix between guys that you want to shout out and guys that you think are first-round picks versus kind of what you think is going to happen uh, once April rolls around. But it feels like the NFL is higher on McCarthy. It feels like a lot of people are very, very in on him that he's going to be a first-round pick. He's playing well this year. This is the best that he's ever looked. You know, you and I talked about this a little bit a couple of shows ago. But it's hard for me to have the Vikings picking at number five and them not taking a quarterback, even if I don't have another one that's close to number five in, on my big board. Because if the Vikings pick at five, you and I have talked about this. Kirk Cousins is not going to be on the team. They're going to have a different quarterback. So, what? what I mean, what am I going to do? Give him a corner? And and people are like, okay, where they're picking at five and you got to pick at a corner and they're not going to have a quarterback. So, I think that kind of um breaks the exercise a little bit at least the integrity of what you do mock drafts for so that's why i ended up having mccarthy going number five because i feel like the league is 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 higher on than him on higher on him than i am and if minnesota's pick at five they're gonna pick a quarterback so is he a player let's let's fast forward this you know however many months we are till till april and think that's that's gonna be the the case this is this will be the top five let's say nothing changes um do you anticipate J.J. McCarthy actually being seen as this kind of top 10 prospect at that point, or are the Vikings making this pick knowing that it's a big reach even at that point, but they need a quarterback? uh, As the cliche goes, a lot of ball game left. And honestly, the reason why I think there's still reservation about McCarthy, even though he's looked really good this year, is – he didn't really play anybody. And unfortunately for Michigan, they're not really going to play anybody until they play Penn State a little bit later in the year. And then they play Ohio State, obviously. They're going to play in the Big Ten Championship, but I don't know who their opponent's going to be in the Big Ten Championship. Last year it was Purdue, and it wasn't really a matchup at all. We knew that Michigan was going to run away with that game, and they pretty much did. 
And then you probably have the inevitable college football playoff. And Kim McCarthy played better in the college football playoff than he did this past, uh, the, the, the last time that they were there last year. Those are the questions that will have to get answered with McCarthy. So I don't think it's going to be nearly as much of an unknown as it is right now of what McCarthy stock is going to be because we will have those games that you can point to and say he played well against good opponents, he played well against good defenses, he played well when the lights were brightest versus right now where you just go, yeah, okay, he's playing really well, but Michigan's so far and away more talented in every team that they've played. I mean, for goodness sake, Michigan scored, scored more than 40 every single game, and they have yet to give up more than 10 points in a single game. They've beaten every single opponent in a not even close fashion. So where I recognize McCarthy does look a lot better this year, to me, it doesn't really matter until he faces those better teams. But we'll we'll get our answer by then, even though it's going to take a little bit longer. Right. Next three teams up in the uh, in the list are non-teams people would have expected at the start of the season. Uh, New York Jets, number six, with their 1-3 and three record. Cincinnati Bengals, number seven, with their 1-3 mm-hmm. and three record. And the New England Patriots, number eight, with their 1-3 and three record. So, yeah. I think there's a healthy chance that two of these teams are picking relatively high. I still think even with all the disaster that's been happening so far, the Bengals are too good to to rank this high in a in a mock draft or in a in a draft by the time April rolls around or even the end of the season, they'll get enough wins to get themselves out. But where have we gone with these three picks? Yeah, I mean, if New York's picking top 10, I think it's going to be O-line. Like, I think you're all in on the Aaron Rodgers one-year thing with 2024, and you're trying to make the offensive line as good as possible. It doesn't matter if you go like, oh, you know, Beckton, you know, play better. We don't need an O-lineman. Shut up. Everybody needs (laughs) O-lineman, especially when you are competing for a Super Bowl. You just, you have, there can be zero questions in the trenches. And right now, there's no questions about their defensive trenches. And one of the best in the NFL, if not the best, if not the best in the NFL in that category. And, to, and the other side of things, okay, there's things to like on the offensive line, but Dwayne Brown's going to be gone. You have Elijah Vera Tucker as a flexible guy, but why not draft Olu Fashano or Joe Alt, be able to play him and, and Mekhi Beck in a tackle, kick uh, AVT inside, let Joe Tipman play inside as well. So that's the better scenario for me. Bengals, kind of the same thing. Offensive line's not good enough, plain and simple. So if they get their chance to draft Joe Alt or Olu Fashano, I think they absolutely should. They could be plug-and-play guys at right tackle, move on from Jonah Williams. And then... Uh, New England at eight, I had them going with quarterback, and this is where I had Bo Nix going off the board because, one, I think that – I think Bill Belichick's going to like Bo Nix a lot. I think he's going to like the experience. I think he's going to like the growth. Bo Nix has legit NFL arm talent. He is a dual-threat player who can operate an RPO offense really well. I think a lot of people look at like, oh, you know, he's just a screen merchant. Like, it's the short average depth of target passes. And sure, there's a lot of those built into Oregon's offense, but don't let the take away from some of the really big throws that he's been able to make. I think Nix was off on a handful of his deep passes earlier on this season. But if he hits those things, man, I mean, we're talking about a Heisman candidate. And so I, I think that his talent level is a lot better uh, than people are giving him credit for. People think about the Auburn days with Bo Nix, and it's, he's just not that quarterback anymore. He's not. So I think the Patriots would love him, and I really don't see the Mac Jones experience surviving past this year. I don't. We're already sitting here poking holes in it and questioning it, and we're four games into the season. Uh, I just I can't see it lasting beyond this year. Yeah, particularly, I mean, if the Patriots overall are bad, it's almost reason enough to kind of press the reboot at that spot and you know go yeah. in a different direction. Um, the last two teams in the top 10, the Arizona Cardinals, who people expected to be picking number one and number two, yeah. uh, and the New York Giants after their dismal defeat last night are now picking 10th. So where are those t- two teams headed? I So I give the Arizona Cardinals Brock Bowers just because he's an insane talent. And even though he's labeled as a tight end, he would be wide receiver one for them. I mean, they would run the offense through that guy. But uh, shout out like Michael Wilson wide receiver mm-hmm. that I really liked in last year's class who's already shown out and playing well. They're getting some stuff out of Rondell Moore, which is nice. And all of a sudden, if you got Michael Wilson, you got Rondell Moore, you got Brock Bauer. It's not bad. It's not complete. It's not one of the best in the NFL, but it's nice. It's certainly a lot better. And you like that building block moving forward on offense. They definitely need help on the defensive side of the football as well. So, you know, an edge rusher here, certainly if they want to take CB1, if they're available, uh, an interior defensive lineman, a Leonard Taylor, a Jerzon Newton, one of those guys on the interior to really shore things up. I think that that could certainly be a target for them as well. But um, rounding it out with the Giants picking in the top 10, we just went over their schedule. I think the Giants are going to end up picking a lot higher than this. 
if they are, quarterback conversation starts to creep up, but Daniel Jones' contract is kind of tough over these next two years. He's basically at least the starter for 2024, and then you got a little bit of an out for him the year after that, so it's not the worst thing in the world. But for this mock draft, I had them going with a wide receiver, Keon Coleman, who has been a big contested catch dude that we have already seen this season play with some big time moments and some big time receptions for Florida State. So six foot four, 215 pounds is Keon Coleman. He transferred over from Michigan State to Florida State, and you're already seeing him deliver on 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 a big stage. So he is that type of alpha wide receiver one, that X type of receiver who can play on the line of scrimmage, play with strength, get off press. He's very comfortable hand fighting, taking contact, going up and turning those 50-50 balls into 60 or 70% leaning his way. That's just the type of receiver he is. And he makes those type of catches that just gets the entire offense hyped up. You know, when you have that kind of player that you know you can go to, even if they're even if they're covered, even if they got guys on him and you have faith in your guy because he comes down with them, man, that just invigorates everything on the offense. And I think that kind of spark is one of a few things that the Giants are missing on offense. But uh, regardless of what's going on at quarterback, they could definitely use a player like that. 